I believe we are live. I got the live button. I got the live clock. It's ticking down and it means we're here. And so I'm really excited to be here with you guys again for another Thursday doing these live calls with old Uncle E. And uh, I've got something unique today, something a little different. I have a guest that will be joining me, really fascinating man who was a teacher at an all boys school in England. And, uh, you know, you would imagine an all-boys school would be a place where tough guys like him are going to hang out. And for sure, he's definitely a tough guy. He was presenting or proposing a debate for the young boys, for the young men to, uh, to speak on as it relates to the positive aspects of patriarchy. And if you've been following my videos for long enough, you know that I've been talking about the positive aspects of patriarchy and in fact, how it is the natural order. It is God's order, patriarchy. And uh, we have been living in a world where it's been denigrated and we've turned away from our fathers. We've been turned away from God the Father and we've been turned away from the natural order, which is patriarchy. So he proposed that the boys would do a debate on patriarchy and apparently rub some people at the all boys school the wrong way and was fired from his job. And so since then, he's gone online and has been creating YouTube videos and sharing his ideas as it relates to making men strong again in this degenerate world through the promotion of patriarchy. And so without further ado, I'm going to allow him to tell a little bit more about what's he got going on. And I'm going to bring him on right now. Hang out. So I'm kind of new to this technology here. Will Noland. And welcome to the show, Will. We got it. Hey, Elliot. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is really cool, dude. So tell us, what is it that uh, turned all boys school so soft that they didn't even want to have a conversation with you about the natural order called patriarchy? Yeah, of all the topics that you'd think an all boys school would be keen on, masculinity is the one, right? right? Otherwise, why don't they let girls in? But I think there's a self consciousness, almost an embarrassment about a lot of the traditional male institutions. Now, they don't really believe in what they stand for. So when I made the case in response to four, five years of boys getting the other side, saying that masculine traits like dominance, aggression, stoicism, etc., competitiveness are all bad things, part of toxic masculinity that we need to get rid of to improve society. Right. And I made the case that these things actually are things that women have valued over the centuries. That caused some shock. A colleague got offended and before the boys were even allowed to see the lecture, it was all canceled. I asked questions saying why can't we have the debate? And that eventually wound up in me being sacked. So I'm curious, what makes you think that these qualities, these masculine qualities like dominance and violence could actually be good? I mean, isn't, aren't these things toxic? Yeah. Let's think about the difference between machismo and masculinity. So in gang culture, for example, and the kind of, chest thumping bravado and displays that you might see celebrated in, for example, some parts of hip hop and rap culture. There's something masculine about that deep down, but it's been distorted. It's been deformed because it's not put in the service of protecting women and children. And ultimately that is what all those traits are for. If we think about this, how a biologist might, an evolutionary biologist, then the way men and women differ is partly as a result of sexual selection. So what kind of men do women want to have families with? Well, you want men who are going to protect, men who are going to provide. And those kind of roles bring with them qualities, what we call the masculine virtues traditionally. So things like you need courage, if you're going to face danger to protect your family, you need to have things like 
dedication and stoicism to work through hard times or obstacles that might come your way and stop you finding resources for them. So it's all ultimately about children, but obviously women are connected to that because that's what the family is. If you disconnect it from children, disconnect it from women, then I think those masculine traits, they've got nothing really to serve anymore and they can become kind of hollow. So is patriarchy uh, these masculine traits, but geared towards the prov provision and protection of women and children? Or is it what feminists have been telling us that uh, it is, which is oppression of, of children and women? Yeah, it's funny that they phrase it in that way, because if you look at the kind of things that women value in men most, around the time they're most fertile, and there's studies on this, it's more masculine men that they value more when they're most fertile, when they're trying to conceive. So it's the exact kind of man that the feminists say that is terrible and oppressive, that women actually find most attractive when they're ready to conceive. And that's one of the things that really caused offense in the talk. So if we're thinking about what patriarchy is, well, we have to face the fact that it's the standard position in evolutionary anthropology that all known societies throughout all of human history have been patriarchies. Now, why hasn't there been one matriarchy, one society where women rule? Interesting question. If it's all a social construct and made up, how come not once in human history we haven't had a matriarchy? strange you'd think there'd be one instead it seems that patriarchy is based in biology is universal why is it what i put forward in the talk is that actually it's that it benefits women patriarchy benefits women benefits children by putting these male qualities in the service of them these are the kind of men that women want and these are societies that ultimately keep children safe. If you have weak men, if you have cowardly men, if you have impotent men who don't even have the capacity to produce children, then what kind of society is that going to be? So patriarchy is based on women's desires, what women look for in men. And that was the most controversial thing hmm. about the talk. If what you're saying is true, then why have we, we been told the complete opposite? Why are we made to believe that these are negative qualities and why have feminists been fighting to smash the patriarchy for so long? It seems counterproductive. Big question. And I actually think it goes beyond just feminists. It, think about the fact that most of the first feminist thinkers were actually men you go back to Marx and Engels, the idea of class oppression in Marxism, where you have the class that owns the means of production, the bourgeoisie, then you have the workers, the proletariat. Now that didn't turn out too well as a theory. The world didn't work that way. They didn't get the revolutionary uprising they wanted. So the same kind of concept was applied to men and women. You still keep the oppressor and the oppressed pair. You just change it to men and women instead. The idea was that private property brought patriarchy with it. That was the theory. Human society used to all be matriarchal. And it was only when private property started that men wanted to try and secure their property rights and then began to see women and children as property as well. Right. But again, nonsense, because private property has existed for as long as human beings have. Resources are scarce. People are going to compete over them. Pair bonding as well. The man, the woman, and the family. That has existed as long as human beings have. These aren't things that we've made up. They're natural. So I think the attack on the father and patriarchal authority started even before feminism as part of the Marxist attack on basically the whole structure of human nature, human reality and society, 
Because if you can attack the father, if you can attack the family, ideally dissolve it, then people become weak. Those structures, the hierarchies, the order, if they're weakened, people become atomized. They lose what they're connected to. And then you can try to refashion society according to how you think it should be. So it's easy to see how the purpose of a man in protecting a village, for example, or a tribe's perimeter is in facing danger. He puts his body in between the women and children and the opponents. But a man can protect things in different ways as well. You protect your culture, you protect your values, you protect your family in ways that don't always involve going to war. So men are about standing on perimeters, whether physical ones or intellectual or moral ones. Think of a father saying, we're not going to have that TV show on in the house. We're not going to have that kind of music playing. We don't do that for entertainment. These are our standards. I'm here as the leader saying we're going to meet them. Well, if you can remove that father as leader, as the authority, if you can undermine that, then you weaken the family and with it society. Well, why would anybody want to weaken society and the family? That's the aim of revolution, isn't it? If you don't like the way things are and you've got a vision of the world, how you think it should be instead, and perhaps that stems from ultimately a hatred of God, the father, because I think ultimately all attacks on patriarchy are aimed at that authority. So patriarchy and earthly fathers, if you attack those, you're attacking patriarchy and natural law as instituted by God, the two are connected. If you've got an authority problem with God, as well as with just human fathers as well, and Marx saw the earthly family as the key to attacking the holy family, he's got a line about that, then the two things stand and fall together. So attacks on patriarchy are ultimately attacks on Christianity. And why would someone like Marx and Engel want to uh, dissolve these structures? What is in it for them? And what is in it for today's Marxists to attack the family and Christianity? Well, ultimately, I think it is to do with power. And if you want to think about the family as being like the last defense against the total power of the state, all totalitarian systems, they all go for children first. They try to get the children when they're young and they see themselves as in opposition to the family. So if we can break that down and make people more powerless, then the state can step in and fulfill that role. So the weaker people get, because they haven't got strong fathers to depend on, the more the state has to step in to play the part. And I think one of the most tragic results of that has actually been in the black community in the US, in the ghettos, because if you think about the way that the black male in particular has been supplanted by the state and single motherhood has been basically almost a state sponsored program. Men have been made dispendable. They've lost their dignity as providers for the family. And it comes back to that point I was making earlier about how you see in hip hop, rap culture, gang culture, some of the most obviously masculine men, and yet there's something that's not quite right there. It's not connected to women, not connected to children. The state fulfills that role instead. And as a consequence, the whole communities are weaker. I think you see it working like an acid, the acid of liberalism, where people use their, lose their bonds to each other and the structure of society begins to break down. If I understand you correctly, you're saying that then the the idea of breaking down the family and dissolving these bonds is a means for the state to gain more power. Yeah, the state but, becomes like the ultimate patriarch. 
But isn't that isn't the state there to help us and to protect us and to give us handouts when we don't have them? Why do we need why why do we need fathers? Why do we need men if uh, the state can do all that for women and children? Well, compared to a father who has a, a personal connection and a duty to his children and a love for them, can a state really compare with that? It's impersonal and it doesn't really love people. You've also got the fact that the family exists before the state. The family is the fundamental unit. It's the cell of society, as Aristotle put it. And the state emerges from that. So from families, you get extended families. Then you get villages, cities, nations. So everything grows from the family. Those are the most fundamental bonds between people. And I think what we're seeing now is, in a way, the clearest indication that the state can't fulfill this function. Because look at what happens to young men in particular without biological fathers in the home. Across a whole range of outcomes, it's much worse for them. Even compared, and this is controversial, even compared to stepfathers. A stepfather is better than having no male in the home for enforcing boundaries and discipline, but it's still not as good as a biological father. So that suggests to me that there's no government official with a clipboard and some boxes to tick who can replace a father's love and authority. The things you're saying make so much sense to me. How did we move away from this traditional structure and way of doing things, which you assert are bio biological, to where we find ourselves today, where a good percentage of people would uh, take issue with the things that you're proposing? This is where I think a lot of the men's groups go wrong because they will tend to blame feminists. They will blame women. And I think that's actually an emasculating thing to do. If you think back to Genesis with Adam and Eve, so she offers him the apple and he takes it because it looks good. It's pleasing to the eye. So he is led astray by his immediate impulses, his desires rather than what he knows is good, which is obeying God's law. Now, in that story, there's a lot that is packed in because it's about men seeking easy gratification, doing what feels good in the moment, rather than sticking to their duty. And then what does he do after he bites the apple? He blames Eve. It's her fault. So it's about men failing as leaders. He wants to put the burden of blame on her instead. And you see that now in many men's response to feminism. Hmm. Now, what I think actually happened instead is that, remember, a lot of the feminist thinkers originally are men. And what happens is that men encourage feminism because it's a way for them to get easy sex is a way for them to get the pleasure of sex without the responsibility of family. So think about free love. What does that really mean? Go back to the 1960s as when most people think of it, the sexual revolution, it actually goes back a bit earlier. And in some of the Marxist writings, you get this fantasy that under these matriarchies that they imagine existed, but we know never really did there was no marriage and everyone could just have sex with whoever they want. Hmm. So that's the vision because in their minds, wouldn't that be great? Free sex, need to worry about monogamy, fidelity, etc. So you've got these guys who in the free love movement, uh, sleeping with women, getting easy sex, but there's a cost to that. It's not really free love. And the cost is that they become boys. They don't have that authority that comes with being the husband, comes with being the father. And if the state comes in to fulfill those duties instead, then the men having abdicated that authority, they've run away from the responsibility 
Of course, they're going to be left feeling frustrated, but it only makes things worse to blame the women rather than the actual ideology at the heart of it, which is actually harming women just as much. So I think the men versus women narrative is the wrong way to go. It's feminism as a part of liberalism, seeing people as just free and isolated, atomized to make their own choices and not fulfill their duties, not respect other people, not see themselves as enmeshed in that whole network of family and community. That's the problem. It sounds like you're saying um, promiscuity and having a lot of sex with a lot of women is uh, actually not helpful towards men's power. But we live in a world where this sense of power is established and maybe even bestowed upon a man for his quote unquote sexual prowess. How do, the, how do you reconcile the two? Are you more of a man because you're attracting and having sex with lots of women? I guess because that's our biological prerogative or is it chastity and uh, maybe a different kind of virtue? Well, to people who think that having sex with as many women as possible and not even being married to them um, is somehow masculine, you need to face the fact that at no stage in human history has promiscuity meant masculinity. Now, I know that many cultures have had men with multiple wives, but that's different. They are married, and that's a lot of responsibility if you're one man trying to provide for five women and their children. And even then, under polygamy, one man, lots of wives, there are no large, stable, successful societies that have operated like that. And the earliest humans lived in monogamous hunter gatherer societies. So we start with monogamy and then human beings being what they are, fallen creatures, lusting after power and tending towards disorder. Of course, we're going to get some men, the most powerful ones, wanting to take all the hottest women for themselves. But the problem is that is bad for society at large. It destabilizes things. And here is where the incel guys nowadays have a point. Because with the breakdown of monogamy, we have got all kinds of problems nowadays. You've got some of the top guys, whether it's just through looks, genetics, whether it's through their earnings, their social status, they can go on Tinder, whatever dating app they want, and basically just swipe through all the girls and take as many as they want. And those women, because they're not committing either to marriage, where are the other guys? the ones who would normally be paired off under monogamy and be able to get settled into families. Well, they feel they've got nowhere to go. And those women who get used and then moved on from by these guys who essentially are creating kind of harems for themselves, they end up bitter as well. And then we've got male behavior making women bitter about men. And that is fueling the whole feminist narrative so historically, what the top men have actually realized is that, no, we need to, for the sake of the whole community, for the sake of the wider society, we need to sacrifice the possibility of all the women we could get for the good of the whole community. We will just pair off with one woman and then we'll bring the rest of the men into the community. So that's how monogamy works, integrating men into families and therefore into society overall. And what we're attempting now to go without monogamy and have young guys just sleeping around, that has been disastrous in the past. So when the Roman Empire fell, the Emperor Augustus at one point was desperate to try to encourage men to get married. Marriage was seen as a burden. Men were running away from it. And he thought, unless we can fix this, then we are in for a decline and we can't reproduce. We haven't got enough people to farm the land. He knew what was coming and it did. Rome did fall partly because of infertility problems. The replacement fertility rate wasn't being met. So you've got 
because of the breakdown of monogamy in Rome, you've got homosexuality on the increase. You've got women no longer wanting to have children because the men aren't providing for them. So all kinds of problems then historically that we have now as well. So I think whenever a society is devaluing motherhood and devaluing the provider role for men in families, then there's plenty of evidence from the past to show that bad things are coming. And I think a lot of young men actually are realizing there's a kind of hollowness to the lifestyle that's being promoted to them as so glorious and so fulfilling. In their hearts, they know it's not. And people are craving that traditional family setup, but afraid of it because there are real risks to it. The way that the courts, for example, tend to treat men when divorce comes up, the fact you can get no fault divorce. Some guys are rightly wary of this and they're worried of losing everything. And my response to that would be that marriage and family are now the battlefield that men have to fight on for the future. And like any battlefield, it can be a bit frightening and you need courage and you need to have your eyes open when you're walking onto it. And you need to do everything you can to take the precautions. And I'm not going to say that that means that everyone's going to be safe. I think there will be some people still, even though they try their hardest to do everything right, just like in a war, there will be some casualties. But it's a man's duty to sacrifice himself for the sake of what is right. So the choice is either now, I think, marriage, family, or you've got chastity, or you've got degeneracy. You can go down that route of promiscuity and see where that leads you. But again, coming back to that point about the ghetto earlier, we know what the results of that are. Look at what happens with people having kids outside marriage. Look at what happens when men aren't part of families. Look at the social breakdown. So I think a lot of men are moving in the direction that you're talking about. And, I, and I'm sure that a lot of the men that follow my videos are agreeing with the things that you're saying. Uh, so I remember reading that Lenin said that to the degree that women are involved with the revolution is to the degree that it will be, uh, it will be um, successful. What does a man do today who wants to follow the path that you're describing do in terms of turning women back to the natural order, fathers, patriarchy, true masculinity, especially when they've essentially been uh, given free reign to you know, live that liberal life that you described, which gives them the power uh, to you know, kill their own children and to have no fault divorce and to uh, you know, use uh, contraception. I mean, even that, I mean, a lot of guys I mentioned, contraception is something that is a, is a negative and that is, uh, that's, hard, that's a hard pill to swallow. But back to the women, what do we do in order to lead women back to this, uh, this way of being, especially when it has such a bad taste, left a lot of people have a bad negative association with it, let me say. Yeah, that's a good question. And from what I've been saying about the importance of fathers within families, hopefully what I'll say next makes sense in the light of that, because we need fathers to be encouraging the traditional feminine virtues in their daughters and having quite open conversations about why what girls in particular are being sold through magazines, internet media, films as a good female life where you spend your most fertile years, let's call it 19 to 26 or so. I think that's around peak fertility or even the whole of your twenties. That shouldn't be spent on a career for a woman because you can see many of them gambling on the fact that when they hit 30, 35, then they'll have kids. And for some of them, that doesn't work out. They can't conceive then. So a woman's twenties are a very precious time and men need to be willing to support women. It's going to be financially. In other words, not treating them like feminists that they expect to go out and earn their own money 
because that is what being a feminist man is, in my opinion. If you are someone who is going to split the bill with a woman you're dating, if when you're married, you're expecting her to pay for her own stuff, you're a feminist. So if you want that traditional setup with a woman, you need to step up to it and be that traditional man. People talk about having a trad wife. Well, with that comes a trad life. And it's a big ask for a man to do that. And I would argue that what men are complaining about nowadays in terms of there being no real rite of passage, like how do you know when you're not a boy anymore now? You haven't got to go out and kill a lion. You haven't got to go out and jump off a bridge mm -hmm. somewhere. You haven't got to go and perform some feat in the wilderness. That craving for a rite of passage is really about a craving for more responsibility. And obviously with that, it's going to come more authority. And you will find that in the demands and pressures of being a husband and a father. Now, are there still going to be some women who don't want to go in for that? Yes. And they might be very attractive ones that your eye, like Adam with the apple, is telling you that's the one I want, but you need to look deeper than that. You need to look for a woman who has shared values and whose eyes are going to be on the same goal as you. And my gut feeling is that you want to look at her relationship to her father as a guide for how she's going to relate to you as a man. So is she respectful to her father or are you seeing that there's real problems with accepting his leadership, his authority, assuming he deserves it because some men don't deserve submission. So you're saying that uh, one of the green flags to look for in a potential wife would be a young lady who has a father and has a, a rightly ordered relationship with her father, back to the father, father again. Um, what other things should young men look for in a woman to determine whether or not she's worth the risk of marriage? Talk to her about what her values are, what her plans are. I think it's good to get married young. So I would recommend that more men get married in their early 20s and getting married to women who are also the same age. So you know then that you're both stepping up to this together and it's her most precious fertile window and think of it as her giving that to you that's a big gift a big commitment and you need to respect that and honor it and it's your job to make her feel secure i think a lot of this comes from women not feeling protected not feeling provided for and basically having to fulfill the man's role having to go out and earn money and create the home and create that environment that the man should be doing for them. So really it's about a, a woman. And I think most women really are craving this, who is willing to follow strong male leadership because the feminists really have got a point in that if a man isn't strong, isn't willing to be a leader, if he's just out for his own selfish pleasure and running away from responsibility, well, then why would you want to submit to his authority? I wouldn't. If I was a woman, I'd be a feminist dealing with that kind of man, one who just wants to sleep with me and then run away from me and not commit. Why would I respect that kind of guy? So you got married young, correct? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so you're... Early 20s. How old were you when you got married? So 23 and then I was raised atheist and found my way to Christian values basically from loving my girlfriend, now wife, and thinking, what is this all about? And being thrown into fatherhood quite young. So my wife had our first when she was 19 and I was 20. So we had kids before getting married, which is not something I'd recommend other people do. Because I think you need to have that commitment in contract in front of all your, your friends, your family and wider society before you have children. That's important. But I didn't do it that way. Um, I know why that was wrong. But at the time, I didn't. And 
figuring it out as I went along and learning from my own mistakes and basically coming all the way from childhood and teenage atheism to where I am now, which is being a proponent, proponent of traditional Christian values. So, uh, you got married early, you became a Christian and now you have six children, six children. Yeah. And when I lost the job, I lost my house with it. So that was big because it was upheaval and I didn't have another house except for the one that came with living on site at that boarding school. Cause so I had to work there sometimes seven days a week, sports fixtures, evening duties, things like that. So it was a big decision for me. And even now, sometimes I think, why well, did I really do that? Did I really walk away from that? And the reason is that to have stayed there would have infected me with something on the inside that would damage my integrity. And I think it's bad for a family to have the father coming home from a job where he's had to break something within himself and weakened himself. So it's more important to be able to look your wife and children in the eye and say that you as their leader, when you go to work, you haven't had to sell yourself out. It's more important to have that integrity than it is to get what feels comfortable. Like with the apple, get what looks good, get the money. So that was difficult and it was a big decision for me, but I think it was the right one. Does your wife work? No. So one of my goals as a, as a man, even before I was Christian, um, has always been to try to make it so my wife has got the option if she wants it of staying at home with the kids. And I've always been able to make that happen. So that's something that I've seen the value of. And I don't think there's any setup that can compare to that. I think it's the traditional setup because it's time tested and it's passed the test for a very good reason. And what woman who has spent her children's years in the office while someone else has looked after them really is going to look back on it and not wonder whether spending more time with them herself wouldn't have been better. I think kids benefit more from a mother than they do from a stranger at daycare. It seems like you're a strong, you know, benevolent leader in your home, uh, protector and provider. How do you handle this uh, challenge and how does your wife handle this challenge now that you have been removed from your line of work? Yeah, so I didn't like the way things were going at that institution for a few years before I had the run in with the debate course. So I was starting to do a little bit of teaching online, one to one work with kids in different countries, just seeing what it would be like if I had to do that full time. And then I knew coming out of that role in that school that I would be okay working for myself online and not having to bend the knee to things that I didn't believe in. So that was the plan just to move from working in the school to teaching online. And I've been fortunate to meet some supportive people such as yourself and some other figures who are part of basically what is an emerging online community for not just young men, but for young people and also not so young people who are interested in the kind of topics I like to talk about. Was your wife worried or afraid? And, you know, did, did she pressure you or how did she, uh, how did she handle it? And how did you deal with her in this way? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So I spoke to her about my worries about the direction that the institution was heading in over the years. And then when it came down to it and I was in conversation with the school about this lecture and I was asking questions about how can we uphold our aims as an institution committed to debate and free speech and discussion how can we do that if we're just going to shut things down the second someone gets offended where does that lead how is it good for the students 
I discussed those ideas with my wife as well. And she didn't want to see me there long term. She also felt that it would be bad for me and for the family if I was being forced to be a part of something that I didn't believe in. So we took the risk together. I don't think being a, a leader means that you just decide th things without uh, talking to the other people you're responsible for. So it was a joint decision. And how old are your children? So it goes all the way from 16 down to age one. And in between, yeah, we've got uh, two, and we've got nine, and then 13, and then nearly 15. And how are you raising your children to uh, embody the values that you're speaking of? Well, hopefully, uh, to the best that I can, um, by example, and the older ones understand what I did um, in my line of work, because I think a big part of being a man is sticking to your principles. It's about doing your duty regardless of human respect or in some cases money. And when I see people who have had similar experiences, not just in schools or universities, but with other companies as well, and I know what's involved in it, I respect that because of the courage that I know it takes. So I think example is one thing. The other thing is that our parents are always the children's main teachers, whether they realize it or not. And even when the kids attend schools and parents feel like the school is mainly doing the job for them, parents are always the biggest educational influence on their children. Let's say you're a father who, when he gets home from work, goes out with his friends drinking straight away. Now he might not feel that he's teaching his children, but he is, they're getting a lesson every day about what a man is and how a man behaves, and how a man treats his wife, treats his children. So be careful of what kind of behavior you're showing. And that's like the implicit teaching. But I think also you need to realize that, especially if they go into a public school, they probably aren't getting the books that you think they're getting. So reading the old stories, it can be the Bible, it can be fairy tales, it can be classic literature and discussing them with your children, especially if it's boys thinking about some of the things like honor and courage, for example, that are often put down nowadays as being somehow old fashioned and past it and not needed anymore. That's really important because a lot of adverts, a lot of popular entertainment is deliberately subversive. It's getting kids to question who they are as boys, as girls, and the traditional roles that go with that. So parents need to be active in combating that because the stream is only going to take them one way if you let them float down it and you have to be strong and stand against it. Do you have daughters? I do. Yeah, I've got four daughters, two sons. Amazing. <laughs> so how are you raising your daughters to be traditional women? I mean, there are so many options for them in this world. Are you sending them to university or are they, uh, what, what is your plan for helping them perhaps be wives and mothers or maybe CEOs? <laughs> yeah. So, the eldest now, 16, she's just finished a big set of exams. So we've got the next step of her future to prepare for. I've had very um, forthright and clear discussions about what the boys her age are now interested in. So we know what 16, 17, 18 year old boys are like. Right. And she's been talking to me about what she's seen as well in her peer group. And it's important for fathers to be involved in their children's lives like that. So you can have discussions that are going to go against the grain of what modern culture is now, because you don't want your daughters in particular being socialized mainly by pop culture and their peer group, because it's likely to cause them a lot of pain. So I think that's important. 
And the other thing is that you need the daughters to have a really good relationship with the mother. So it, this is things like could be cooking together. It could be household chores as well, cleaning, washing up, laundry. I think acquiring habits from what household management actually involves from your mother and seeing that she's doing it because she loves you and she wants to create a nice home environment and why that's valuable. That's some of the most useful teaching I think that young girls can get. And if anything, they're told the opposite now in school. They're told that a successful life as a woman means basically behaving like a man. And that's why feminism, I think on the deepest level is actually a kind of misogyny. I know mm -hmm. that sounds crazy to say, mm -hmm. but <laughs> feminism tells girls that the key to success is behaving like a man. So as a Christian, how do you raise your children in the faith? I think what I've said about school, sadly, um, applies to many churches as well. So the, the parents need to also catechize the children as well. And sometimes this means using older books than you might find easily in the store. So the Baltimore Catechism from 1895 it's really good. I'd recommend that one with the young kids. It's got some nice pictures to go with it. And don't do it with a light touch. So you can just read a few of the questions out, see if they know the answers, have a discussion about it. And then once you see that things are becoming tough, especially if they're very young kids, you can do some drawings or something based on it instead. But I think the the parents need to remember that not just, um, you know, history or maths or geography, but also the faith and teaching the kids why some of the objections they might have heard from peer group or heard in lessons at school uh, can be answered that's really important and encouraging the children to pray as well try and get to church once a week and i think as well having a good relationship with your own parents so showing that family goes beyond just your own household and that you are their father, but you're also your father's son and you are respectful towards him. Mm -hmm. I think that shows that they know that, okay, dad's the boss, but even he has a boss because you've got the idea that the, the man looks to God and then the woman looks to the man, the child looks to the woman, everything's like a chain of command. So. This is where I think some of the feminist critiques of patriarchy go wrong in presenting the man as a kind of tyrant, you know, who can do whatever he wants. Whereas really the father's legitimate authority comes from placing himself in that position as servant, ultimately. So the authority is given to him because he's assumed that role. I get a lot of pushback from people when I speak about authority. Why do you think there are so many men that are anti-authority today, either uh, don't respect authority, uh, and obviously, if that's the case, don't know how to hold themselves in a place of authority? I think one reason is a confusion between authoritarianism and authority. And it comes back to what I said about the authority figure being imagined as a kind of tyrant. Authority doesn't mean just getting your own way all the time and bossing people about. It's about leading people towards what's good for them, not what's good for you. Now we've got that idea of the common good for the family and for society as well. And that your your rights and your duties um, exist in a network. So uh, a right is something that's owed to another person. Like a child has a right to the father's attention. It's not about people being just individuals that aren't connected. So if you see your authority as being more like helping people achieve what is good for them and thereby fulfilling what is good for you. So a man 
reaches his potential, reaches his fulfillment as a father. I think that's what manhood ultimately is, the potential for fatherhood. And becoming a, a good father, working hard at it, is the making of a man. Same thing with womanhood, being the potential for motherhood. That's where the transgender ideology comes from, I think. The second that the feminists tried to say that being a woman is something other than having the potential to become a mother, they opened the door to transgenderism. Because let's say you think being a woman is having um, a really good career and spending lots of money on cosmetics and clothes and behaving like you see some of the female pop stars. Well, okay, fine. A trans woman can do all that too. All of it. Right. The one thing they can't do is conceive, give birth, a nurse. So you've basically given up. You've moved yourself away from that one thing that really makes you a woman. And then you've made the question, what is a woman? Open game for anyone who wants to say, okay, fine. If it's not becoming a mother, then I'm a woman. And you've got no comeback. So I think feminism's stuck on that one. Either it's return to womanhood as potential for motherhood, just like manhood as potential for fatherhood, or um, it's going to be eaten by its own offspring, which is the transgenderism. Women's sports, etc., will be ruined because they can't right. face the fact that motherhood and womanhood go together. Right. <laughs> so I want to circle back real quick. I, you mentioned the Baltimore Catechism, and I smiled because I became a revert to the Catholic Church when I turned 40. My question to you is, as someone who grew up as, a, as an atheist, why return, well, of course, you return to Christ, but why through the Catholic Church? Oh, we're going to get into big topics about why not Protestantism here. Right. For, for me, it's because I suppose being confronted with what really happens when you think things through to a conclusion made me think, okay, let's go back to basics. Let's look at the tradition, not just scripture, but tradition as well. Um, what's been said over the centuries about Christianity? What do I find most convincing? And the, the quickest way to do this would be that without that authority, which the Catholic Church claims, you essentially end up with so many different voices. I think it's about 30,000 different Protestant sects all saying that they have the truth, they have the answer, and they all contradict each other and all saying that the Holy Spirit says they are right, but they can't be right because it's mutually exclusive. In a way, the Catholic Church, because of that authority, and it's also got the patriarchal structure built into it, that to me gives the strongest response to the problems of modern liberalism, which is basically saying that autonomy is the most important thing in life. And I see the, the Reformation and Protestantism generally as being basically liberalism and autonomy in the religious sphere. And I have no interest in that. I know people do. To be honest, I haven't got much interest in arguing the case either because if people want to listen, if they want to read what the church has got to offer, great. But if they're very emotionally hostile to it and not really interested in dialogue, then I see it as largely a waste of time. But the, the church offered, for me, the strongest explanation of why patriarchy makes sense socially, but also uh, spiritually as well. Amazing. Yeah, I think um, we can track back to at least the Reformation, this whole sense of anti-authoritarianism. Anti yeah, and liberalism. Yeah, I think, exactly, Amazing. yeah. So we, we have about five minutes left, and uh, I wanted to ask you if you would be willing to give us just a succinct list of three things that you think if we all as men put our minds and effort towards and made happen collectively, what would those three top priorities be for us in order to return to some semblance of order in our world? 
well, that's a great question. People aren't going to like this. This is going to be tough. It's going to hurt. But the fact that it hurts should tell you that it's like medicine. The wound will sting. So what I was saying earlier about the sexual revolution and men becoming boys by taking that offer of free love, you need to go back to what happened sexually and reverse it. So you mentioned no contraception. I think that's spot on. And you can broaden it out to no sex outside marriage. Now that alone is going to be like a hammer blow to most guys straight to the skull. Because think about what modern culture suggests is a good way to live as a chad or a stud now as sex isn't it easy sex with lots of women well if you do that you're a feminist because feminism is all about <laughs> sex outside marriage so one stop being a feminist no sex outside marriage and the next thing is you need to respect your ancestors traditions and the fact that western culture there's no getting around this is ultimately built on Christianity and maybe you're not a Christian okay engage with it so you need to make a serious effort to read the Bible rather than just dismissing it pretending that somehow you know the answers because I find that a lot of guys who will say that they are atheists or agnostic they decided that about age 12 and they've never moved beyond the 12 year olds right. level of understanding of it so stop pretending that you know all about it when you've never even looked into it. So no sex outside marriage, study the Bible seriously and respect the fact that most of the greatest minds of your culture, your tradition have believed in it. And what makes you so special that you figured out something that they couldn't. And then for a third one, Ooh, this is difficult, but I would say that the best job might not always be the one that pays the most money just like the best woman for you might not always be the most beautiful i mean it's possible but she might also have terrible values making money you're the number one guiding principle of your life is likely to weaken you i think that's one of the things that has made what people describe as the the woke movement so damaging it's mainly enforced by the HR companies, the big corporations, and men are willing to sell themselves out and be what I would describe as intellectually gay for pay. They will go in and they will take the cash to humiliate themselves and promote ideas that they know uh, damage into them as men, damage into their traditions, damaging for the future of their children as well, if they even have any, all for the sake of money. And that's, again, something you can see historically. Wow. It's a kind of weakness in a man. Yeah, that is an amazing list. So chastity, Christianity, and noble work. Yeah, that's it. That's the three. Amazing. Well, I have two questions I think my wife sent me here from the people in the chat. And so if you'd be willing, we'll take the next just couple of moments, answer these questions for the fans watching. And then we'll wrap up. How's that sound, brother? Sure. Let's this do it. has been amazing. I've really enjoyed this as my first interview for this series. And uh, man, there's, there's so much to unpack here. So we've got one question, though, which I think you've sort of answered already, but maybe we can get it in a succinct form. Icy Saccharin writes, uh, by the way, thank you for your super chat, 799. He says, what are your views on polygamy? He says, our cavemen ancestors fought over women and resources and kings from Asia, Middle East and Africa had multiple wives. Yeah, in fact, I think it's about 85% of human societies have had either, well, it's polygony. So polygony is one man, multiple wives, and then polyandry is one woman, multiple husbands. Now that's never really worked out. One woman, multiple husbands, it's, but that's never really been a stage in human history. Polygony though, multiple wives has been, um, and you see it now in the Amish, for example. But what I was saying earlier about the fact that humans start off monogamous, the earliest human beings are monogamous, and then people lust after more, basically. People are corrupt, they want more power, they want more women to themselves. It's been tried, we know it doesn't work, as well as monogamous societies, 
And we also have it from the Bible that Christ comes and corrects the polygony of the Old Testament patriarchs who have many wives and says, no, it's two becoming one flesh. So there's the Christian authority for that. Yeah. But monogamous societies, to put it bluntly, outbreed the polygonous ones and they're more stable and more successful. So it's the right thing for a man to do for the community at large, even if you might like the idea of having multiple wives. The other problem is that it's disrespectful to women to have multiple wives, to put it bluntly, because you can't ever really be equals. Now, a man and a woman as husband and wife are equal. I don't mean identical by that. Equal and identical aren't the same thing, just like you can have an isosceles triangle and a scalene triangle. They're both triangles equally, but they're not identical. The man and the woman are equally important within the marriage. They see eye to eye. They just have different jobs to do, so they're not identical. But when you have one man whose attention lots of women are all crying out for, and there's that asymmetry in the relationship, it's bad for the woman. So if you look into the science on this, I'm not even talking about the religious arguments now. If you look into the science on it, when you get multiple wives, there's really only one true wife. The others have their fertility suppressed to some degree, and you get all kinds of tensions and psychological problems within the family that's bad for the children. But it's a fact scientifically that you get one woman who really is the, the wife, and the others are all suppressed somehow. Amazing answer. Thank you very much. The second question was actually a statement, but I'm going to pause there. Will, can you tell us more about where we can find you? I know you're making some awesome YouTube videos. I think my fans would love to continue to indulge in the type of conversations that we're having. Where's the best place for them to reach you? Yeah, so YouTube channel is Noland Knows, and that's a channel name that the boys at the school I got sacked from helped me come up with. I liked it because it's catchy. So I've kept that old channel name and you'll find a mixture of what we've been talking about today, but also some literature on there too. And if YouTube's not your thing, I know some people don't like it, then you can find me on Substack, which I've found is the place where I can say what I want without things violating community guidelines, because I do run into that problem sometimes on YouTube. So Substack is a bit more academic, mixture of book reviews and articles and uh, podcast episodes too. So you can find me on there. Very cool, man. Well, this has been a pleasure, dude. I really appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Appreciate having this conversation with you. And uh, if you just hang out for a moment, I'm going to end the stream. And then I just want to wrap up with you behind scenes. How's that sound? Brilliant. It's been an honor to be the first live interview guest. Thank you. You got it, Will. Talk soon, buddy. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye.